Lord Jesus said, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. You then pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, we begin this morning by singing from the screens our version of these words, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father God, who dwells in heaven, draw near to hear your children.
As we sit then, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord our God, how gladly we come before you, naming you as our Father in heaven, and knowing that we can call you Father, because we have been brought into your nearest, into your deepest family by your own beloved Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And how we rejoice to glorify you by exalting his great name and loving it, and cherishing it, and, and proclaiming it in all the world, the name above all names. However much by some that name is hated and makes us hated also, we rejoice in that name and we love the Savior's name. To us indeed it is the sweetest name on earth. And we know also it is the name most revered and blessed and honored in all heaven. And how we long, O oh God, for that kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, to be known fully and completely here on this earth. In this benighted world of ours, so aching for the day of release, the day when at last we will see the full potential of your wonderful creation released from the curse of sin and death resplendent in glory as you have purposed that it shall be. Indeed, we pray, may your kingdom come and may it come quickly, O Lord. So, may you bless and equip your church in all the world to speed its coming as it lives out your light and your righteousness and your grace and your mercy and your truth. And as it proclaims the great salvation that is in Jesus alone. So help us, Lord, we pray this day. Help us in our part in all of that. In our great aim and purpose in life. To make Jesus Christ known. And to speed his kingdom to come. Grant us, we pray, the daily provision that we need for these our earthly lives, to live for you, to serve you. Grant us also, we pray, the protection that we know that we need, protection from evil and from the evil one, from evil without and also, sadly, so often from evil within. We know, Lord, so often it is the sin still lurking within us, deep in our own hearts that floors us, that hampers us. Help us, our Father, we pray. Keep our enemy from us. Protect us from his flaming darts. Grant that we who have found your wonderful grace in Christ may live out his mercy truly in this world that we might be those who forgive those who do evil to us that we might be people who even rejoice in the midst of the trials and the storms that this life brings us rejoicing because we know that we follow in the path of the Lord Jesus our great Savior who when he was reviled reviled not but trusted himself into your hands who sees all things and who judges all things rightly and will judge all things eternally. So help us, O oh God, our Father, we pray. Hear us as we come before you as your children, needing you, knowing our need. But knowing the one to whom we bring all of these, our needs, our cares, our concerns, our requests. Hear us, we pray. For everything we ask is in the name of your beloved Son and our great Savior, 
Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to all of you uh, this morning up here where I can see you or downstairs where I trust that you can see and hear us. And uh, we'll look forward to meeting you and greeting you after the service. If you're here for the first time, let me uh, particularly welcome you. And I hope that you feel very much at home here with us as a company of the Lord's people. And our prayer is that you will be refreshed as we join together in worshiping God this morning. Can I draw your attention to these sheets? There should have been one somewhere on your chair or under your chair or in the hymn book or uh, into your hand on the way in. And uh, it contains a number of different notices, all of the things going on in the life of the church this coming week. You'll see there in the middle panel. Don't forget to be in prayer for all of these things, uh, whether you're directly involved or not. Uh, things going on nearly every day. And uh, we covet the Lord's people to be praying. Notice on Wednesday, the lunchtime talk, do remember Josh as he preaches at lunchtime, and uh, this Wednesday evening is our small group Bible studies evening, and uh, those will be happening around the city or centrally here, and if anybody wants to know any more about that, please do grab me or one of the uh, ushers or staff after the service, we'll be glad to point you in the direction of uh, one of these groups. Perhaps also mention particularly Friday morning, uh, the new men's Bible study meeting on the south side. Uh, in uh, Battlefield at 7.30, an early start, but uh, do make the effort and come along and join. Paul, you're waving at me. Ah. It's a light bite just around the corner from coffee scene. Is that right? Okay, good. Speak to Paul Hodgkinson afterwards if you're in any doubt about that. Well, I'll leave you to uh, peruse these at your leisure and uh, do use them to help you in your prayers throughout the week. But we're going to turn now to our Bible reading. You'll find it there in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. And we're back into uh, this study on the Sermon on the Mount that we started just a few weeks ago. Matthew, chapter 5. If you have one of the Blue Church Bibles, you'll find that, I think, on page 810. And again, we're reading this... Uh, passage at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, we call them the Beatitudes. And uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, where Jesus is teaching his uh, disciples, those he has already called to follow him. Uh, we read that in chapter 4, verses 18, and following how he called these brothers, Simon and Andrew, to follow me. And then he went all throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and affliction from among the people. And here Jesus is, teaching uh, the gospel of his kingdom to those who are gathered around to follow him. So Matthew 5 and verse 1, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he had sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. And may God bless to us this, his word. We're going to sing again, this time from our blue hymn books here, and you'll find the words at number 806, taken indeed from these Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see their God. The secret of the Lord is theirs. 
Their soul is Christ's abode. Number 806. Well, as the uh, musicians play quietly now and as our offerings are received, perhaps you'd like to read and meditate upon these words that we'll be studying again shortly. As we do that, though, in the quiet, our offerings are received. Let's pray together. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, this is the prayer that you have commanded us to pray and taught us to pray. 
And therefore, this must be a prayer that you desire to answer and will answer, and indeed are answering even now. Although so often our blinded eyes see only in shadow what it is that you are doing in this world and how. But we have great confidence, Lord, in all that you are doing and have promised to do indeed all that has been accomplished through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through the sure and certain hope of the resurrection life that he has brought already into this earth and into this world in his own risen life, a life promised for all who are his and indeed for this whole universe when one day in the twinkling of an eye will at last be changed and filled with the righteousness of the glory of heaven as the waters cover the sea. But today, O oh Lord, we look up at, out upon our world and we see a world full of hatred and malice, full of discord and strife, full of anger and disappointment and hurt, where the evil heart of man is, it seems to us, so often unbridled in causing so much damage, so much ill, so much pain. We hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nowadays we see on our television screens and on our computers and mobile devices bombarding us day after day with news which should really be called bad news. So often it is tinged with darkness and horror. And yet, O oh Lord, we know the truth that you have conquered the powers of darkness and that even now as your gospel proclaimed in every part of this world is heard and is responded to, so you are saving men and women and boys and girls from out of this evil age and for the life of a new creation, the world to come, already begun through the gospel of your kingdom taking hold in this world and the lives of so many around the world who, like us, love the name of Jesus and bow in obedience to him. But, Lord, we long for your church to thrive and to expand and to touch with the love of Christ every part of this suffering world. We look out upon our world and we see so much to fill our prayers. We think, Lord, of the terrible conflict continuing in Syria despite what is said to be a ceasefire which doesn't seem to be stopping the bombing or the killing or all the terrible things that are going on there forcing so many to flee the country and flooding the land of Turkey and from there Greece and so much of the continent of Europe with refugees and others fleeing and seeking a better life. We pray, Lord, for a measure of peace at least to come to that benighted land. We pray for the great power brokers behind the conflict, the Syrian government, the various opposition groups, the mighty power of Russia flexing its muscles so effectively, it seems, in recent days. We pray for the United Nations, the European Union, for the government of Turkey, so close it seems to becoming involved in military incursions into the land of its neighbor. We fear, O oh God, the outcome of such things and we cry to you in our ignorance and in our helplessness, but knowing that we come to you, the one who sees all and knows all and indeed controls all. Hear our prayers, O oh God, we ask for peace in that part of the world for an end to violence and for a restraint upon the hand of evil men. We think, Lord, of a world that is so buckling under 
continuing economic crisis with fear surrounding the globe as markets crash, as people fear that governments and central bankers have lost control of a world economy. For some, that simply means a diminution of great wealth. But for others, the hapless victims of economic collapse and calamity may very well mean great poverty, hardship, and even starvation and loss of life. Again, O oh Lord, we pray that you would look upon this world in mercy, restraining evil, restraining the folly in the hearts of men and women, restraining those who think that they can be as gods and act like gods. Remind us, Lord, that we are but mortal, but feeble. We can see only in part. Drive our governments and leaders, we pray, in our own Western world back to the values which gave the very governments that they now inhabit, but which so often now they see as unnecessary and hindering relics from a past. But the democracies, the freedoms, the rule of law, so many of the things that we take for granted and that we cherish did not come out of the heart of man, but came as built upon a foundation that came from the truth of God. And now we're seeing in our own land and throughout the continent of Europe and across North America, the disillusion, the anger, the unrest among populations that have lost confidence in their leaders and in political and economic elites who have drifted so far as to be totally out of touch with the lives, and the desires, and the needs of ordinary people. Have mercy upon us, O God, in these days of great moment in which we live as our own nation faces another great referendum in June of this year, as the United States faces great and important elections for the next president in the autumn, as the whole of our continent in Europe faces such uncertainty over the future of its grand project, of its currency, of all of these things in which people have put their hope and sought salvation. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Turn our continent, our nation, turn our world, we pray, to seek the truth where the truth may be found, in the light and the life that is in our Lord Jesus Christ, in his word, in his way, in his kingdom, a kingdom so utterly foreign to the kingdoms of this world and so hated, therefore, but the only kingdom which will last forever and which will outlast the sun and outlast this present world and prove to be a foundation upon which to build our lives that is sure and certain, a rock which will not collapse. And so, Lord, we pray for your church in this, our own land, a land so in need of the enlightenment of the gospel of Christ. Forgive us, Lord, for our erring from the truth, for our loss of confidence in the rock-solid certainty of your gospel, which is unchanging and unchangeable. Have mercy, Lord, on our churches throughout this land which have silenced your word and therefore have so often shut the kingdom of heaven in the faces of men and women and boys and girls. Have mercy, O God, and return, we pray. Return with fire to bring cleansing to your church, to bring humbling to those who have been called to proclaim the gospel of Christ. Bring, we pray, a deep repentance 
among all who would name the name of Christ and profess to proclaim him in this land of ours and grant that once again there might be a free, unfettered preaching of the word of Christ and the liberation that that gospel brings that it might be known here in our city and in our nation and among our peoples. And so, Lord, we pray for ourselves, first of all, this morning, that you would make us humble hearers of your word, that you would grant us humble, penitent hearts, that we may repent and turn from all that has grieved you and come longing for your word of life, seeking it, taking it in, inwardly digesting it, and making it part of our very lives that we might live for Christ alone and that you, our Master, might lead us in his way. So hear us, Lord, and help us and open our eyes as we come now to your word for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we sing together number 556 five, in our blue books. Jesus, Master, at your word we are gathered all to hear you. 556. Five, Well, do turn with me, if you would, to the passage we read there in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, page 810 in our uh, church Bibles. And after a week off, we're back again to basics. Maybe you're feeling a little insulted by all of this back to the ABC of Christian discipleship. Perhaps you're feeling you're way beyond that stage now. You've been a Christian for many years. But let me say this. As every great one really knows, the real secret of greatness in any sphere is that you're never 
going to make any progress unless you keep going back, back, back to where it all began and back to remembering what it's all really about. A friend of mine uh, just the other week sent me a book. I haven't quite worked out why he sent me this book yet, but anyway, he has, and it's called Built to Last, The Successful Habits of Visionary Companies. There's by a man called Jim Collins. Some of you will have heard of him and read one of his other books, Good to Great. It's been one of the most... Uh, successful business books, uh, I think, of all time. But anyway, I was wondering why I'd been sent this book and reading the first couple of pages. I'm still trying to work it out. But I was struck what was said on the very first page about the title. The author says this, uh, in some ways, it's the wrong title. Because this book is not fundamentally about building to last. It's about building something that is worthy of lasting about building a company of such intrinsic excellence that the world would lose something important if that organization ceased to exist. I found that rather striking. It's about building something worthy of lasting. Well, how much more ought that to apply to the company of believers that the Lord Jesus Christ is building? He is building something worthy of lasting for all eternity. And so I think we need to listen, don't we, to the founder of this great company telling us all about the intrinsic excellence of what it is that he is doing. And we need to grasp the picture and the plan that he is laying out for Christian discipleship that is worthy of lasting, not only through this life, but through all eternity. So we're we're going back again to look at the marks of Christ's people and to this portrait of true Christianity according to the Lord Jesus that he is painting for us here right in the the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in these Beatitudes. And uh, we've seen already that in many ways this portrait that Jesus is uh, is painting for us uh, is a very shocking one. I don't mean shocking as in uh, in some of the modern art uh, that we get today, you know, where you uh, pay 50 million pounds for an upside down dead sheep in a tank of formalin, that sort of thing. Some people really do have more money than sense, don't they? But it is, nevertheless, a kind of upside-down portrait that Jesus is painting for us here. Because, as we've seen, the way up in Jesus' kingdom is the way down. And uh, it's the way down into the dust. It's the way into humility. It's the way even of death. And that's how Jesus talks. It's a cross-shaped portrait, if you like, of life that Jesus paints for us here and paints for us all through the Gospels. And that's why the dark shadow of the cross looms over Jesus' life, even from his birth, even from the very beginning of the Gospels. Go back and read Matthew chapter 2 and you'll see so clearly. That's why Rembrandt's famous painting of the Adoration of the Shepherds has that shadow of the cross looming over the scene, even there in the stable from the very beginning. And Jesus makes it plain right from the start of his ministry that the shadow of the cross will also shape the life of every true Christian disciple, of everyone who follows him. Take up your cross and follow me, he says. Lose your life for my sake, and that's how you'll find it. Listen to the words in Matthew chapter 16. You might like to look them up, where he's talking about the shape of Christian discipleship. Matthew 16, verse 21, we're told Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. But then he goes right on, doesn't he, to describe the disciples' life. Verse 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That is the true shape of Christian discipleship according to the Lord Jesus. Now that is very different, isn't it? from what we sometimes hear evangelists and preachers talking about today. When they want people to come to Jesus and find health and healing and wealth 
and prosperity and fulfillment and all of these things. But the shape of the cross is always there in Jesus' teaching, and it's right here in these Beatitudes, as we've already been seeing. And we've seen that there's a wonderful simplicity, and indeed there's a wonderful progression in these Beatitudes as you follow them through. Just look back at them again in chapter 5 there. These first four Beatitudes, they describe really the way into the kingdom of heaven. And what they're describing is that pattern of the cross applied to someone's experience to crush and to destroy all sense of self-righteousness. It's a death, isn't it, to everything that this world esteems and approves. And it's a death indeed to all of our own self-esteem. When we are crushed, when we are empty, then we are submitting, well, just to the approval of God and not this world. We find then something that he alone can give. His declaration of blessing that, that, that can't be found any other way in this world. So verse 3, you see, it's not the spiritually rich who accomplish being blessed. But it's the poor, the bankrupt. It's those who have nothing to offer to God and who know that. And it's not verse 4, the happy and the carefree. But it's those who mourn. It's those who know the reality of their own sin and who weep because of it. And it's not the mighty in this world's eyes, verse 5. It's not the self-assertive who can force their way into the kingdom of God. No, it's the meek. It's those who are humbled before God and who have buried all their pretensions, who have bowed to the sheer grace of God in Christ. Verse 6, it's not those who are satisfied with their own pedigree, with their own righteousness. No, it's those who realize their emptiness and who hunger and who thirst for God to fill them with his righteousness. That's the way into the kingdom of heaven, says Jesus, and that's the only way. It's the way of, of finding God's grace through Jesus Christ, his Son. And of course, that simply baffles the world. Because it's the very opposite, isn't it, of the way the world thinks and acts and lives. Just look at the language that we use so often in our own world. We talk about climbing up the ladder, don't we? Whether it's a career ladder or the property ladder or whatever it is. We talk about moving up in the organization. We talk about rising up in the rankings, in the league tables, whether it's schools or hospitals or whatever it is. That everything has a league table nowadays. But here with Jesus, you see, the way in and the way on is the way down. That's so foreign to our thinking. Think of the English Premier League. I don't know if you follow the football, but if you do, this year's story is Jamie Vardy, isn't it? Leicester City. It's absolutely extraordinary. But it's going to take a monumental effort, isn't it, for Leicester City to remain on top They've got to keep scoring goals. They've got to keep staying up. They cannot afford to slip down. Otherwise, Arsenal or Chelsea or whoever will just beat them to the top. But you see, in, in Jesus' kingdom, in the everlasting kingdom of heaven, it's only those who have gone down, who have been to rock bottom, who can find a way in. The doorway of grace has that very, very low lintel. And you have to stoop to enter. You have to leave all your pride behind. And the way on, you see, in this kingdom of Jesus is just more of the same. And that, too, is utterly baffling to our world. Look at the second half of the Beatitudes, verses 7 to 10. You see, they're simply speaking, aren't they, about living out the reality of that grace that we've found and which has come to us totally from outside of us altogether as a gift of God's blessing. But you see, God's blessing, God's grace can't come into our lives without becoming part of our lives truly. And so these things that are described in this, these verses here are simply the badges of membership of Christ's kingdom, proving that what has been hidden in our hearts is really real. Because, as we said last time, finding God's grace will inevitably mean living God's mercy. 
The real disciple, verse 7, a kingdom person, is merciful. Well, they must be because they, of all people, prize mercy. They love mercy because they've received mercy from God. And therefore, they'll love their neighbor as themselves, which is just the other side of loving God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, which is just what verse 6 is saying. Because to hunger and thirst for righteousness is to hunger and thirst for God himself, the righteous one. And the real disciple, verse 8, you see, is pure in heart. That is, they're transparent, they're honest, they're sincere before the world of men and women. And that's the outward mark of meekness because the real disciple has buried all pretensions. The real disciple has faced God with honesty and sincerity and truth about themselves. And therefore, they're liberated to be transparent and sincere before all the world. You see, when you, God, when you know that God has seen through you and seen through all the spin and the deception and the pretense, when, when he has seen to the real you, well, you don't need to hide any longer, do you, the real you from anybody else. You're liberated. And the real disciple, verse 9, you see, is a peacemaker because he knows what it means to be at peace with God. And therefore, he's a true son of God. He shares the characteristic of his heavenly father. And so he loves to bring peace to the broken and ruptured relationships of this world. There's a correspondence there, again, I think, to the second beatitude in verse 4, because mourning for sin means that you want to deal with the awful consequences of sin wherever you see that in the world and to bring peace. You're simply living out the grace of God that has flooded into your life as the mercy of God and the peace of God floods out of your life. But then look at verse 10, this last beatitude. Because there seems to be a real paradox there, don't you think? Real disciples, those who are, are merciful, those who are pure in heart, those who are peacemakers are persecuted. Peacemakers find themselves at war, according to Jesus. Well, that can't be right, can it? That must be a mistake. Surely that's not something that does fit into this portrait. There's been a, a, a word in the wrong place here. It's like a blot, isn't it? It's like a bit of paint that's got on the canvas off the palette in the wrong place and needs to be scraped off because it's spoiling the picture. peacemakers being persecuted. Well, a lot of preachers today, a lot of churches today want to wipe that blot off the canvas, don't they? Surely if the church truly did live like this, as Jesus is saying, with the character described here in verses 7 to 9, surely it would be like heaven. Surely it would be peace on earth all around Christ's people. Surely these people would be feted and loved by the world. No, says Jesus. Live like that and it will mean persecution on earth. It will mean conflict all around his people. Because, you see, although the kingdom of God has come in Jesus' coming, and it is yours now when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, nevertheless, there is a not yet also about Jesus' kingdom. Look again at verse 3 and verse 10. Look at the first and the last Beatitudes here. I wonder if you noticed that these two Beatitudes are in the present tense, aren't they? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But in between, in verses 4 to 9, all the rest of them are in the future tense. Do you see that? They shall be comforted and so on. You see, there is a now, there is a present tense reality and... There is also a not yet, a future. All the blessings of Christ's kingdom, although they're real already, will only be complete and fulfilled in the future. Only when Christ's kingdom is consummated. Only when the Lord Jesus comes again to fully establish his kingdom, to usher in the new heavens and the earth forever. Only then... 
will there be an end to all mourning? Only then will we fully inherit the earth. Only then will there be a full and complete satisfying of all of our longings, all of our our hunger and thirst for righteousness and so on. Only then will we see him. Only then will we at last rejoice physically present in the Father's house. But until then, Jesus won't allow us any romantic naivety. He's quite clear. He's quite open. Look at verse 10. People who hunger and thirst, who love righteousness, who love God's kingdom and all his ways, will be persecuted for righteousness' sake. Why? Well, as Jesus puts it rather starkly in John's Gospel, chapter 15, he says, If the world hates you, it hated me first. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. It's because, you see, to be a real Christian, to be a real follower of Jesus, is not just to find his grace and not just to live his mercy, but it is also to share Christ's experience. Jesus is very straight. There's no spin. There's no soft sell. There's no hiding it away in the small print. No, there is a paradox that is at the very heart of all true Christian discipleship. The true disciple is blessed. There is great rejoicing even now, not just in the future. But at the same time, Jesus says, the real disciple will have scars. You will be reviled on my account, says the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice again the symmetry of these Beatitudes. You see, the eighth one takes us right back to the first. Both are in the present tense. It's very deliberate. It's definitive. Theirs is now the kingdom of heaven. And indeed, what Jesus is saying is that this last one, in a way, is evidence of the first. The truly poor in spirit who has been humbled by God, they are truly blessed now, even if they are humiliated by the reviling and the persecution of men. How can that be? That really does sound upside down, doesn't it? The world laughs at that kind of thinking. Who wants to be reviled? Who wants to be slandered? Who wants to be persecuted? There can be few things as stressful in life as as false and slanderous accusations. Perhaps when you were young, you were taught that nursery rhyme. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never harm me. Friends, it's not true, is it? It's not true. Tell that to the teacher who's been suspended on false allegations of of uh, maliciously abusing a pupil. Tell it to the person who's been accused falsely of rape or sexual assault or something or child abuse 30 years ago in the past. People will seldom ever recover from those allegations, will they? Even if months and years later a court of law totally exonerates them. It's too late. So often their lives are broken, their families are broken, their whole future's in tatters. And yet Jesus says to his disciples and to his true followers, those who are committed to him and to his kingdom, that this will be the road that we must walk. But he also says that in that path, even now, not just in the future, but in that path lies the way of blessing now. The way of real Christian discipleship means that we will be both reviled and rejoicing at the same time, now, in this world. Because that's what it means to be united to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We share truly in Christ's experience. Let's think about those two words which dominate verses 11 and 12, reviled and rejoicing. Rejoicing. Blessed are you when others revile you on my account. Jesus is absolutely open about the scars of real discipleship. In fact, it's so important that this last message in verse 10, he takes, you see, in verse 11 and 12, he expands it and he applies it personally 
to his disciples in front of him. Do you see how he speaks about them all the way through? And now in verse 11, he turns and says, Blessed are you, you followers of me. And you must grasp this above everything else. You see, Jesus is a preacher. He's not lecturing to these people about a theory. He's not just um, giving them some sort of interesting abstract ideas for them to ponder and throw around and uh, chat about over coffee. No, he is proclaiming to them personal truth. He's giving them a word that's to be received, that's to be digested, that's to be learned and lived out in real life. And that's why we're all here this morning too, isn't it? Not just to hear some ideas to be interested in and talked about. Not to just hear about an explanation of Jesus' words, but to have an encounter with Jesus, the Lord of glory himself, who is speaking to us as he spoke to them. He's proclaiming personal truth to each one of us this morning who wants to be a follower of Jesus. And he's telling us, he's telling you, people of my kingdom will have scars. You can't share in my blessing, says Jesus, without sharing in my scars. Because the world hates Christ and no disciple is ever greater than their master. If the world hated him, it will hate us also. And friends, if you're a follower of Jesus today, you need to know that. You need to know that. Discipleship, if it is real Christian discipleship of the real Jesus, discipleship is cross-shaped. And there will be the marks of the cross upon your life if you follow him. You cannot have the blessings of God's grace without the implications of his grace in your life. Because our world can't stand the gospel of grace. Grace is so utterly destructive to this world's cherished values. It hates it. See, the world says, blessed are the achievers. Blessed are the self-fulfilled. Blessed are the attractive. Blessed are the assertive, the powerful, those who satisfy themselves. Blessed are the manipulators, the clever wheeler dealers, the expedient. But Christ's grace is the great humbler, the great leveler. It denies all of that and says no to that. And so therefore it wounds to the very heart all the pride of this world that we live in. And therefore the world will never accept a wounding message like that. And it will hate all of those who proclaim it and live it. And it will hate those who rejoice in a message of grace. And Jesus says to us, you need to know that. You need to understand that. But you also need to know, verse 11, when you are reviled, when you're persecuted, when you're slandered for Jesus' sake, you also need to know that you are blessed. Because these scars, according to Jesus, are the very evidence that you are a beloved disciple, not that you're a failed disciple, not that you're someone who's made a great mistake, and that's why this is happening to you. Of course, he is talking about reviling on Jesus' account, not on your own deserving. He is talking about false accusations, not true uh, allegations about your bad behavior. Jesus is not excusing Christians here from being rude and obnoxious people. Of course not. But when it is for the sake of Christ and his gospel that we suffer, well, as John Stott says, being despised and rejected, slandered and persecuted is as much a normal mark of Christian discipleship as being pure in heart and merciful. You see, that scars are just as much a mark of the grace of God at work in your life as poverty of spirit as a merciful outlook is. And both of these things and all of these things are essential for those who truly follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Scars for Jesus are just another outward and tangible and visible sign of a heart that is inwardly transformed by the grace of God in Christ. A heart that is changed so as to transform your whole future. If you'll allow me another illustration 
uh, from the cardiac clinic. It's like a patient that you see coming in to see you. And last time you saw him, he was puffing and panting and struggling along and barely able to walk. But this time, he barges into your room, red-faced, looking healthy, tells you he's walked two miles to the clinic instead of getting a taxi to the door like last time. And he hasn't had a pain in his chest for months. What's happened? Well, you get him to take his shirt off and put him up on the couch, and then you see a great big ugly scar all the way down the middle of his chest. And you give it a poke. You always do that. <laughs> and it's tender and sore. And it looks really savage and nasty. But you see, that scar is what explains the total transformation that's taken place in that person's life. From invalid to fighting fitness. What's happened? It tells you his whole heart has been revascularized by coronary artery bypass surgery. That's what it tells you. And that telltale scar is the inevitable consequence of that heart rescue operation. And so it is, you see, with the heart rescue mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be scars. There must be scars. Because it can't be any other way. For your heart to become mine, says Jesus, I have to get in there and possess that heart. You have to be transfused with the life that only I can give you. But that means that my life must become a real part of your life. And your life will become so closely identified with mine that the attitude of the world to me will become the attitude of the world to you. The disciple is like his teacher, says Jesus, the servant like his master. And if they call the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So you see, if we are true disciples of the real Jesus Christ, we will share the experience of Christ. And there will be reviling, there will be persecution, there will be all kinds of slander and false accusation against us on his account from the world. There will be the scars from the, the new atheist types like Richard Dawkins who think that we are utterly deluded. There will be the violence from the Muslim extremists who love to kill Christians in Pakistan and in northern Nigeria and in the ISIL territories and in other places, even our western cities today. And there'll be the revulsion even of friends and family, won't there? Perhaps lovers who hate that our commitment to Christ means that we can't join them in the lifestyle that they've chosen and want us to choose to live along with them, but we can't. They'll hate us. The world hated Jesus and his ways. And if his life is in you, my friend, the world will hate you and the ways of Jesus in your life. As will the religious establishment, just as it did in Jesus' day. Those who loved their institutions, their temples, their priesthood, their traditions. But they hated the real Jesus. They hated his words that challenged everything that they held so dearly. They hated him because they were spiritually bankrupt and dead. And so it is still today. If we are true disciples of the real Lord Jesus Christ, we will share the experience of Christ. And friends, that means that there will be scars for us. Scars for you. Scars for all who will follow the real Jesus. And just as it is, if we're not living Christ's mercy, we need to question whether we've really grasped the gospel, whether we really have ourselves found God's grace in Christ. So also, surely Jesus means that if there's no reviling, we must also question whether our faith is true faith at all. Because as Paul wrote plainly to the church in Philippi, it has been granted to you, that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Blessed 
are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amy Carmichael, the great missionary of Donavour in India, knew that, didn't she? And she expressed it so eloquently in the poem that many of you will know, Hast Thou No Scar? She imagines Jesus talking uh, to somebody who claims to be his follower and indeed who is someone with a great reputation as a follower of Christ. And the Lord says, Hast Thou No Scar? No hidden scar on foot or side or hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear they hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archer spent. Leaned me against a tree to die and rent. By ravening beasts that compass me I swooned. Hast thou no wound? No wound? No scar? Yet as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Can he have followed far who has no wound or scar? To have no scars, no wounds from reviling or persecution or slander that's always part of a discipleship according to Jesus That ought to be a cause for real soul searching in us. Because according to Jesus, if we're not sharing his experience, well, though we might prophesy in his name and cast out demons in his name and do mighty works in his name, the likelihood is we don't really know him at all. And he doesn't know us. If that's true, he'll have to say, won't he, on the last day as he says, A little further on in Matthew chapter 7. I never knew you. Not really. Not at all. And that you see is why scars and wounds from all that we may face in our walk with Jesus. That's why they are a cause for rejoicing. Don't forget that second word. We are reviled but we are also even now in the midst of these things says Jesus in verse 12. We are rejoicing. We can rejoice and be glad he says. Why? Because in sharing Christ's experience, look at verse 12. He tells us in sharing his experience, we are confirmed in our part in his great unfolding story of salvation forever. We are not out of step, but we are in step with his marvelous purpose of grace. We are not abnormal. We're not struggling and scarred because we're failures, because we're abandoned by God, because we're no use as Christians, but because he is at work in us and through us. That's why we rejoice. Rejoice, he says, because we stand four square with all the true faithful ones of the past, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And rejoice, says Jesus, because we stand four square in the company of those to whom belong The inheritance of the future. Look, your reward is great in heaven. And that is the wonderful, wonderful message of grace and glory that wounds and scars for the sake of Christ serve to tell us. Even when we're stung by the present pain that these things bring. It's just like for the heart bypass patient. Every twinge in that scar in your chest reminds you of the wonderful reassuring fact that your heart has got the blood flowing in it again and that you're not going to collapse with pain and breathlessness. But you can stride out and walk and get on the golf course and do all the things you used to do. And friends, you see, that's why being reviled For the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ should make us rejoice. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice. And be glad now when all these things happen. When your friends at school make fun of you. And they call you names. They call you a Bible basher. They call you part of the God squad. 
And they beat you because you stand for Jesus, because you go to the scripture union at school, because you won't do some of the things that they do and won't say some of the things they say. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Rejoice because Jesus knows, and he knows that you are the genuine article, that you are the real true disciple. Rejoice and be glad when your family might resent your newfound Christian faith and quite falsely accuse you of all kinds of things and say, oh, you're neglecting your duty to the family. You're neglecting all the things you should be doing because you give yourself so much to that church and to all of that. Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad when people that you've loved scorn and hate you because you can't remain any longer in a relationship with them because you know it's wrong and you know it's a relationship that grieves the Lord Jesus Christ and you've chosen him over them. Rejoice and be glad in the pain and heart-rending scar of that moment. Rejoice and be glad even when you're hurt badly by colleagues, by friends, even by family. And they say things to you and do things to you that are painful because of your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or because of your commitment to him, you do lose out tangibly in earthly things, in the job that you might have had, the career you might have progressed, the spouse you may have had. If you hadn't committed to give all in your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and had lived the way that you could have lived, under your own steam, under your own rule. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And all these things, all these things that bring scars, these are the things that have marked out the real believer, the people of faith, from the very beginning all the way through. You see how, in a sense, this last beatitude in verse 10 and its expansion and its, its application here in verses 11 and 12. It's the real test, isn't it? It's the litmus test of all the other Beatitudes. It's the test, in a way, of whether you've really grasped the truth of the gospel, of the, the revolutionary kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and what it means to be a disciple of his. Because if, if you really are still focused on this world, the here and now, on material things, on, on peace, on prosperity, on fulfillment, then all of that sounds like utter, utter madness. You can't possibly rejoice in persecution and slander and reviling. That is, is masochism. That is madness. Well, you see, friend, if that's how you think, you still have not really grasped at all the truth about this kingdom Jesus is speaking about. And if that's so, it's very unlikely, actually, you can really stomach any of the rest of these Beatitudes either, if you're really honest. You might have previously thought these were wonderful sayings, but not any longer. Because to be truly humbled by grace, which is what all of these Beatitudes are about, to be truly humbled in that way costs everything in this world. And many, just like the rich young ruler, find that cost too great and tremble and back off and walk away. But maybe over these last few weeks, you have grasped Jesus' teaching. Perhaps you've been like one of those looking in in the crowd as Jesus taught his disciples here. And you've been listening. And maybe you've heard Jesus speak and you've realized that he is what you want. That you want that real righteousness. That yes, you are willing even to suffer for him. Because you so thirst for him and you want him more than anything else. But then you read these Beatitudes about those who are blessed and you say, but, but that just isn't me. I am proud. I haven't mourned for my sin nearly enough. I'm not meek. I'm not pure. I'm just not worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ, although I want him. Well, that just brings us right back to verse 3 where we began, doesn't it? It's the only place you can begin. And if that's how you feel, that you are just in the place you need to be to receive God's blessing in Christ, you're in the only place that you can receive God's blessing in Christ. 
knowing that you are poor in spirit. But blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so that kingdom can be yours, and it will be yours if you come to Jesus with that attitude of heart. If you receive from him what you can't possibly ever offer to him. There will be scars. There will be reviling and persecution and all kinds of evil falsely against you on Jesus' account. Not one of us friends can change that. But Jesus says also there will be reward, great reward in heaven. Because the Lord Jesus has loved you and he has overcome this world. And he says there will be, even now in the midst of that pain, there will be great rejoicing and great gladness of heart for all who share Christ's experience. They will share increasingly in the blessing and the joy of his everlasting kingdom of mercy. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, how we marvel at your kingdom, which so turns our world upside down. But how we rejoice in your grace, that so turns our lives upside down, that you can make us rejoice even in scars incurred for the sake of your Son because they remind us and they proclaim to us that we truly belong, that we have your marks upon us, and that we therefore have your arms around us. So help us, we pray, to rejoice and be glad when others revile us and persecute us and even utter all kinds of evil against us falsely on your account. Help us to rejoice because we know that so it has always been for the people of yours and because we know that great is our reward in heaven with Jesus, our master and our friend. So in his name, we commit ourselves to you. Amen. We're going to sing together as we close from our blue hymn books, number 663. Number 663, you'll walk with Jesus. You will know how deep, how wide his love can flow. They only fail to prove his love who in the ways of sinners rove. Walk with him now. That way is light. Number 663.
Let's pray. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.